Coming up later in today's presentation. I'm wondering at what point we're just developing complex math models to explain complex math models and we really haven't you know made much progress mm -hmm. along the interpretability axis so you have something you don't understand and you explain it with something you don't understand if i have if i have some general formula just some very general formula and then i go in there and i go you know what this formula has five parameters and if i make this one 0.75 and that one one third and this one two and that one zero and i call this the megatron activation potential and i go and write a paper about it that's really just an arbitrary selection of a bunch of numbers and then you gave it a fancy mathematical passport and you got it published in some journal and now everybody has to memorize that as you know the megatron potential and kind of learn about it and that's a lot of what's going on right now is that it's really just a bunch of hacking Welcome back to Street Talk. Today, we're going to be talking about interpretable machine learning. Enjoy. Interpretability has become one of the most important topics in machine learning, and it's something that every data scientist needs to be familiar with. For hundreds of years, we've had simple interpretable models like linear regression and rules-based systems. But in recent years, there's obviously been a huge rise in more complex, bigger, non-linear models. And of course, predictions from these models are not always so easy to explain. So as we start to use these more powerful non-linear models to actually make decisions on real world matters, then it's inevitable that our attention must now turn to interpretability and explainability. When I first started learning about machine learning algorithms, I was told they could be dangerous. They were hard to understand. They were black boxes. But as Christoph lays out, it turns out there is a whole plethora of techniques out there to explain why a model made a certain prediction. Some models like low dimensional linear regression are intrinsically interpretable. You can just look at the model coefficients and that tells you exactly how the model is working under the hood. Then there is a whole suite of methods that will actually work with any ML model, like training a local surrogate or a global surrogate. There's also Shapley values, which is a really cool technique that allows you to distribute blame for the prediction amongst the input features in a really theoretically sound, really principled way. And then there are domain specific methods for example, to explain image models, you can try to highlight the most relevant parts of an input image by making saliency maps. And there's more. You can look at things like example-based explanations, where you try to find the smallest change in the input data that would cause the output prediction to change. So maybe with this awesome new interpretability toolkit, we can start to dispel that myth that Machine learning models are all just black boxes that can't be understood and can't be trusted. Christoph Molnar is one of the most important people in the interpretable machine learning space. In 2018, he released his magnum opus, Interpretable Machine Learning, a guide for making black box models explainable. Interpretability is often a deciding factor when a machine learning model is used in a product, a decision process, or research. Interpretability methods can be used to discover knowledge, to debug or justify a model and its predictions, to control and improve the model, to reason about potential biases in the model, as well as increase the societal acceptance of models. But interpretability methods can be quite esoteric. They add an additional layer of complexity and the potential pitfalls require expert understanding. Machine learning models are inherently less interpretable than classical statistical models, but typically they have a better predictive performance, and that's because of their ability to handle non-linear relationships and also higher order feature interactions automatically. But do we have to suffer this implicit trade-off between the complexity of a model and the lack of our ability to understand it? 
Simplistic model approximations can often mask important information and be misleading as a result. In classical statistics, there's an entire field called model diagnostics to do exactly this, to check that assumptions and simplifications have not been violated. This is something that does not yet exist in interpretable machine learning. Interpretability has exploded and matured in the last few years, in particular since the deep learning revolution. We now have a better understanding of the weaknesses and strengths of interpretability methods. A growing number of techniques are available at our fingertips, but can lead to the wrong conclusions if applied incorrectly. Is it even possible to understand complex models, or even humans for that matter, in any meaningful way? That is one of the questions that we're going to be discussing this evening. Molnar also recently released a couple of papers where he discusses some of the important pitfalls of interpretable machine learning methods. So some of the things that Christoph Molnar is really concerned about is the lack of statistical rigor in IML methods. Molnar used to be a statistician. Also, he is exasperated with some of the uh, misguided causal interpretations from some of these IML methods. He also points out feature dependence or situations where you have shared information between features. It completely breaks many of the IML methods and, and this is something that he focuses on a lot. He also focuses kind of philosophically on the broader impact of interpretability and what it what interpretability even means frankly it's it's a very nebulous term so let's have a quick flick through this paper interpretable machine learning a brief history state of the art and challenges and as well as pointing out some of the history of IML methods you know we'll jump straight into one of the challenges which is feature dependence Molnar points out that um, feature dependence makes attribution and extrapolation problematic this is exactly what happens in partial dependency plots for example we are basically extrapolating and we are creating fictitious data points that didn't really exist and these fictitious data points probably exist outside of the data distribution so Molnar thinks that the models that we build should reflect the causal structure in the world but of course that is not really the case most of the time and he points out that statistical learning is just reflecting surface feature correlations not the true causal structure beneath the scenes Causal structures would be more robust if we could actually capture them. And the predicted performance and learning causal factors is a conflicting goal, which I think not many people have thought about. So we need to think about when we can make causal interpretations. And a lot of work is, is underway in this field. But being completely frank, this is very nascent. There's not really much out there at the moment. Mona also points out this lack of statistical rigor. Um, having been a statistician himself, he was exasperated when he came into the IML field just to see that most IML methods do not even give you confidence estimates, something which is completely standard in the, in the statistical world. Models and explanations are computed from data, which means they are subject to uncertainty. But this is something which is just not captured using current methods. He says that we need to be making distributional and structural assumptions. He points out this risk of p-hacking, something which is prevalent in the natural sciences. This is something that could be coming to the world of IML very soon if we don't start thinking about this more carefully. Molnar also points out that there is no accepted definition of interpretable machine learning methods. So it's not entirely clear how we can compare IML methods to machine learning models. It's really easy to assess machine learning models because we have benchmarks and we have ground truth labels, right? I mean, those benchmarks are fraught with problems as well, but we can't really quantify how correct an explanation is and it doesn't really help that there's a taxonomy of interpretability methods right there are objective methods like sparsity and interaction strength and there are human-centered evaluations from domain experts or from lay people and quite often you need to have quite a lot of technical knowledge to even understand these assessments he says that the setting of machine learning is too static, it doesn't reflect how these models are actually used in practice. And I really love this idea of thinking about a process rather than thinking about just the model. So he says we need to have a holistic view of the entire process. 
He thinks that we need to think about how we explain predictions to folks from diverse backgrounds, how we have interpretability at the societal level or at the institutional level, thinking much more broadly than we are at the moment. He also thinks that we need to reach out to other disciplines, for example, psychologists and social scientists. And he thinks that there's lots of rich knowledge in computer science and statistics that we're just not using yet. So in July of last year, he also released this paper, Pitfalls to Avoid When Interpreting Machine Learning Models. In this paper, he points out that there's a growing number of techniques providing model interpretations, but many will lead to the wrong conclusions if used incorrectly. And he goes on to point out many of those pitfalls. For example, the first one is assuming that the model generalizes well. So assuming that the model has been fit correctly, if the model is underfit or overfit, then the interpretation method will perform badly as well. An interpretation can only be as good as the model underlying it. So the next pitfall he points out is the unnecessary use of complex models, which is to say the use of opaque or complex machine learning models when an interpretable model would have sufficed, which is to say when the performance of an interpretable model is only negligibly worse than one of these black box models. And to be honest, this is something I see all the time. I think the gratuitous use of complex machine learning models is something which is really serious. One of the things I don't like about machine learning is the laziness I think we should always seek to understand and simplify problems wherever we can. It's the same thing in software engineering. We should always be trying to create the most elegant and simple and maintainable solution. We shouldn't be trying to overcomplicate things. And I think that's a very, you know, the KISS principle is, is very generalizable here. So he recommends to start with simple interpretable models like generalized linear models or lasso models or additive models, decision trees or decision rules and gradually ratcheting up the complexity as required. So he also points out that ignoring feature dependence is super important, right? And this is a problem that many of the IML methods have. So he gives an example of partial dependency plots where they extrapolate in areas where the model has little uh, uh, training data and it can cause misleading interpretations. So these perturbations produce artificial data points that are used for model predictions, which in turn are aggregated to produce global interpretations. So that's a big problem. Another thing he points out is confusing correlation with dependence. So he gives an example here, features with a, a Pearson correlation coefficient close to zero can still be dependent and cause misleading model interpretations. While independence between two features implies that the Pearson correlation coefficient is zero, the converse is generally false. So it's a pretty cool example here. This is um, a couple of features that absolutely have a dependence on each other. You can see it visualized here, but you wouldn't know that if you looked at the Pearson correlation, it would have said that it wasn't significant. Another one, a misleading effect due to interactions. So there's a couple of things here. There's the partial dependency plot on a couple of dependent features. And then he's used a simulation to kind of uh, trace all of these different features to see what the predicted label was. And according to these IML methods, there is actually no clear dependency um, between these features and, and the predicted outcome. Whereas you can see that that's just blatantly false. So something I've been meaning to do for more than a year now is to go through Molnar's interpretability book and to make some bite-sized videos on every single approach. Well, Connor and I are actually gonna do that over on Machine Learning Dojo with the first one next week on Shapley values. So make sure you subscribe to Dojo and check that out. Remember to like, comment and subscribe. We love reading your comments and we'll see you back next week. Welcome back to the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel and podcast with my two compadres, Connor Tan, who runs the Thomas Bayes Appreciation Society and <laughs> MIT PhD, Dr. Keith Duggar. Now, um, they say that Germans are known for beer, sausages, precision, and these days, interpretable machine learning. We have an exemplar German on the show, Christoph Molnar. Hi. Now, uh, Christoph made waves in the community uh, when he released his magnum opus, Interpretable Machine Learning, a guide for making black box models explainable. If a machine learning model performs well, why don't we just trust the model and ignore why it made a certain decision? Well, the problem is that a single metric, such as classification accuracy, is an incomplete description of most real world tasks. And that was according to Doshi, Velez and Kim in 2017. In Christoph's book, he introduces the importance of interpretability and reports an incredibly detailed taxonomy 
of interpretability methods, and his style of writing is at times entertaining and entirely absent of hype and nonsense. He runs the gamut of interpretability models, so for example, model agnostic methods like Lyme and Shapley values, example-based methods such as counterfactual examples and adversarial examples. He motivates the importance of interpretability methods, but he's also extremely transparent about its current weaknesses and pitfalls. He's currently finishing his PhD in interpretable machine learning at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich after getting a stats master's from the same institution. He's recently written several very interesting papers on interpretable machine learning. For example, Pitfalls to Avoid When Interpreting Machine Learning Models in July of 2020, where Christoph detailed several problematic model interpretations. For example, ignoring estimation uncertainty, feature interactions, or confusing correlations with dependence. More recently, he published a paper called Interpretable Machine Learning, A Brief History, State of the Art and Challenges. While he acknowledged that the field is maturing nicely, he also spoke about some of the serious challenges in IML methods, such as the lack of statistical uncertainty, shared information between features, lack of a clear definition of interpretability, and the need for a more holistic view. Christoph Molnar, it's an absolute pleasure and welcome to the show. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. You know, Christoph, I have to say I really enjoyed your book. Um, I read this actually some months back in preparation for a completely different show. I loved how scientific it was. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was very much laying out essentially a survey of the facts, a lay of the land, very objective evaluation. It had both the pros and cons, you know, of different approaches, examples to make them, you know, more understandable. So kudos to you. I, I thought it was a great book, very enjoyable and, Thanks a lot, Keith. and very informative. I also loved how it lays out at the beginning, you know, what the what the goals that we're trying to achieve mm -hmm. with, with interpretability are, especially kind of the, the human goals, right? Like yeah. what does it mean for an explanation to be good for people? What kind of explanations do people like? And sometimes there can be conflicting conflicting goals there. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one thing that, that I realized from reading your book is that that actually explanations can be deceptively good. Yeah. Like I think I, I think the 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 sort of cognitive bias maybe that we have to look for contrastive explanations or counterfactual explanations. Like in principle, it seems good. It's kind of like, you know, I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, we can't give you this loan. You know, well, why not? Like, why why can't you give this loan? Well, well, we've detected really that you're a that you're a deadbeat. What do you mean I'm a deadbeat? Yeah, you know, you never pay your bills. Well, let's see why. Okay, let's look through this and we find a decision tree here and, and some big decision tree and we get to this one little point. Yeah. Well, it says here, you know, you didn't pay this furniture bill back in 2018. You know, if, if, if only you'd have paid that furniture bill, like we'd, we'd be able to give you the loan, right? But the truth isn't that simple. Like it's actually buried all throughout yeah. throughout the decision tree, right? With so many contributing points. Yeah, I think uh, like this chapter that you referenced uh, was about like kind of from the social view or the human view, what what, what people like or prefer as explanations. Um, and the whole chapter is based on, um, I forgot the title of the paper, it's uh, like from Miller um, about like what we can learn from the social sciences about what a good explanation is and was like a paper where I learned a lot and it was super interesting also to see how like what people think are good explanation, as you mentioned, they should be contrastive, they should be short, but they should also uh, confirm to some prior knowledge that the people have. Um, and, and I mean, like objectively, a lot of those things might not, like you wouldn't say these are good explanations in, in some sense, like maybe, um, maybe it's not good to give an explanation that fits with a priori knowledge um, because it's not the correct one maybe. So, um, was quite uh, interesting to, to learn and to, to think about like what's the human side of it. That's a very cool part of your book, I thought, the fact that it's actually quite interesting thinking about what we really want out of an explanation. I remember, first of all, looking at, you know, sharp values that mm -hmm. are very fair and will distribute the blame equally amongst all the different relevant features. Yeah. And then you turn to something else like, you know, um, selective interpretations that in a, in a way are way less good because they're kind of arbitrary. They'll just select a few yeah a few a subset of the features and give them all the blame but then it turns out that apparently that's what people actually want as yeah. a useful interpretable explanation yeah so as i see there's like many many dimensions of explainability or like what what can be uh, a good explanation and and one of uh, these dimensions is maybe sparsity that you have a short explanation with just a few facts 
Um, that's something that people prefer maybe. Um, but this might be in conflict with uh, other dimensions of a good explanation, which should be maybe that uh, all uh, causes should be addressed by the explanation that, that play some role at least. Um, but this is of course in conflict with sparsity, um, if you want this full attribution like you get with Shapley values, for example. Um, so I, that's why I also think there's not like just one correct explanation, but there's like many attributes or many dimensions on which you can judge explanations. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the problems because even machine learning is really difficult, right? Because we use benchmarks mm -hmm. and benchmarks are just something that people have come up with. But you, you say in your, you know, you, you talk about one of the problems being that there's no definition of IML methods to start with. But at least in machine learning methods, we have ground truth, mm -hmm. which, which is which is significantly better in, in a way. But um, if we if we can't quantify how good a, a, an explanation is, then where are we really because you, you talk about a kind of taxonomy of interpretability methods right you say that there are objective evaluations like sparsity and interaction strength and fidelity um and human uh, human centered evaluations you know which might come from domain experts or, or mm. lay people so i, I suppose you're, you're just hitting straight on the fact that this is actually quite nebulous isn't it yeah so yeah I, I, so in some sense like there's this big criticisms of okay this is not scientific or not well defined at least what interpretability is how can we even do research in this area um but i, th I have a bit more relaxed view i mean otherwise i should have stopped writing the book uh, before i really started um so i, I kind of see like this inter or this endeavor of giving interpretability or bringing interpretability to machine learning it's more like a first of all it's just a keyword so it's it kind of bundles all the methods together that kind of aim to reduce this high dimensional function to something, well, mostly it's something in a lower dimension. So we kind of just do this mapping. Something gets lost in a way, this is fine. And it's, I think, part of science to find out like, or to, to yeah, some, or part of analysis to find out what part gets lost. So when you, for example, look at uh, just um, some feature importance values, for example, of course it's a, a summary of, of your model and a lot of information gets lost um, but but I still think um, it's it's useful to have obviously so many people use it but it's useful to have these uh, tools and we just have to understand um, what they do and how to interpret the results so how, how do you interpret when like uh, the feature importance is zero of a feature could that be quite dangerous though because uh, you gave the example of random forests when you have a lot of shared information between the features um, it would actually tell you that these correlated features have a higher feature importance than you might otherwise expect so does this imply that we need to have very detailed knowledge of how we should how we should use this information that we get from iml methods yeah so it's also kind of the direction in which i write papers like this pitfalls um, to avoid and stuff like this so I, I think, so these are just tools. So they, they do something with the model. They kind of distill some knowledge. Um, so for example, for feature importance, you kind of uh, measure how well does your model perform. And then you measure again after you uh, shuffled one of the features. And, and then, then you get something out of it. So then we can ask questions, is this interpretable or not? And it's kind of, well, not so relevant the question because you just have to understand what what happens when you shuffle feature and one is for example um, you kind of break the association between the feature and um, the prediction because now it doesn't carry the information about the target anymore because you shuffled in ra randomly in your model so you kind of this this feature importance now measures how much performance you lose because of this break of information but um then you also, when you think about this method and, and want to use it, you also have to understand that this shuffling, for example, breaks also association with your other data, uh, feature, like the features in your data. So this is a limitation of the method. And um, what I think is needed is that we understand in which way these methods break or in which scenarios we're allowed to use them or how we are allowed to interpret them. Um, and I think the situation is kind of uh, similar to statistics where you have to, these models and, and then you interpret like the coefficients of your models, you still like have to learn how you do the interpretation, what are the assumptions that have to be met that you are allowed to do this interpretation. And I, I think it's, we're in a similar simil uh, situation here with interpretability of machine learning.
And, and I'm glad you mentioned sort of the old school linear models as well as dimensionality in this thread because you make a very good point in the book, which is, look, even these so-called intrinsically interpretable models are only interpretable up to a certain dimensionality. And, you know, I have I have tons of experience with, with multilinear regression, mm-hmm. right? And, and I can guarantee that beyond a very small number of dimensions, those coefficients are not interpretable because it starts to play a bunch of games where it's inflating one coefficient and another because their difference is important and, you know, whatever else is happening. A lot of correlated structures are all essentially getting compressed into this small number of small mm-hmm. number of weights, right? And so as the dimensionality goes up, I would say like no model is is intrinsically mm-hmm. interpretable. The same can be said of decision trees. Like yeah. anybody who's looked at a decision tree that's come from real data, you're going to find out it's not interpretable. It's like, oh, look at this. You know, market capitalization matters. Oh, and it matters over here too and down here. And, and actually I have to go through five checks on market capitalization before I get down to this decision. Uh, and maybe the features aren't that intuitive either. And then you have to cl- kind of like mentally stack up like until you get to the decision, like five uh, decisions. And then yep. you have a very complex uh, rule that, that led you to the uh, prediction. Um, yeah. So I agree that um, there's, there's, it's not like, the, I mean, I have I have this distinction in the book, like interpretable models and not so interpretable models. Um, but it's as you say, it's like a gray like it's a scale, really. People could definitely overhype how interpretable these white box models are, right? Whether it's linear models. So I'm a, I've worked with many physicists who uh, have had guidelines that you should only ever use models like a decision tree because it's possible, in theory, to write down on a piece of paper exactly how the decision is made, right? Yeah. You can trace every decision. But that's never actually useful in practice, is yeah. it? Since when have you ever looked at a decision tree fitted to data that's for any complexity. And the fact that in theory, it's possible to go and examine how it works. Yeah. It's completely irrelevant in practice, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it can be useful to have like a short decision tree um, sometimes, so it, but in practice, it will not like give you probably the best predictions, um, but it might be useful sometimes to shorten it artificially. So even like you're throwing away some, some predictive accuracy, um, but you shorten it. So you understand that somehow it's manageable. You can have a look at it and, and see uh, what's going on. Well, there's also, you know, the other issue is that as I was looking through a lot of the methods that you describe and you survey in your book, you know, some of them um, are not simple. (laughs) I mean, if you start looking at partial dependency plots and trying to explain what those are, I mean, you know, you have to almost have a deep mathematical knowledge really to appreciate them in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering at what point we're just developing complex math models to explain complex math models and we really haven't you know made much progress mm-hmm. along the interpretability axis yeah yeah that's true it's also like the criticism to like um so you have something you don't understand and you explain it with something you don't understand um i think some methods are complex um but for some at least there's some intuition how they work um for partially dependence plot is kind of your this um Intuition that you do some intervention on your model, intervention on your data. So you replace all your, um, like for one feature, you replace all the values with one fixed value and kind of look at the average prediction that you get afterwards and do this for a lot of points. And then you connect the points and you have this curve. So kind of gives gives you the expected change um, over the feature range. Uh, maybe there was already a bit <laughs> complex. I don't know. Um, maybe I'm too deep in, into the uh, method already. Um, but yeah, of course, it's it's something additional people have to learn or if they agree to use it, of course. Could I get a quick take from you on saliency maps as an example? Because you, you said in one of your YouTube videos that saliency maps are glorified edge detectors. They are not mm-hmm. good explanations at all. And I've noticed now that many machine learning platform providers are building these kind of um, saliency maps into their models you know into their platforms Mm -hmm. and then it becomes a kind of box ticking exercise where you can say okay well yeah we've done interpretability now that's all you need to know and that really is quite a false sense of security isn't Mm -hmm. it it's funny you mention uh, the saliency maps because i'm uh, writing a book chapter about it and actually i'm I'm, i wanted to publish it today maybe i will or at least in the next few days um it has been a long time in the making and it was very very frustrating like by far the most frustrating chapter to write 
Uh, number one reason is because there's so many methods out there. Uh, reason number two is I, I can't judge really or, or if they work and, and it seems like they mostly don't or it's it's still unclear like how you say you would judge that they work. So they're like dozens of these like integrated gradients, gradients, deconf net, deep tailor decomposition, layerwise relevance, propagation in 10 variants. Um, so and then I mean you in the end you when you apply these methods on they are also like for image classification and you get these nice looking images and some areas are highlighted, some are not. Sometimes you can say, okay, this doesn't make sense at all. Um, but if if it kind of makes sense, then you maybe would be inclined to trust the method. Um, but then there's this uh, um, paper, which is called um, Sanity Checks for Saliency Maps. And they kind of found out that they, the most of the methods are very similar to edge detectors, meaning that they are kind of insensitive to the model and the data, which is very bad, of course. Well, if you change the model, um, the explanation should obviously change. Um, could, could, could you expand on that a little bit? So, so you said it, it wasn't really a reflection of the model or the data, but mm -hmm. what, what would a perfect saliency map look like? Well, I don't know myself, actually. So, I mean, the, the idea is that you, so the basic idea of most of these methods is that you you have your class prediction or your class score, and you want to backpropagate it. Not uh, you want to backpropagate it to the original image. So you look at the gradient um, with respect to your input pixels, and that's there's no not not one way to do this, but there are many different ways. So that's also why we have so many different methods, and then they highlight which pixel were relevant for the classification. Um, but yeah. They these these methods they have like a lot of like issues. For example, there's uh, the issue of saturation, for example, because of the ReLU unit that where you have flat parts of the gradient. So if you pass the gradient through that, then um, your method would say that some some neuron might not be uh, important at all. And there's a lot of these little issues that these methods have. Um, yeah. So, but but back to your question, like. I think that's also the issue that I don't wouldn't know how to answer it. I mean, obviously, it should be some area that should be highlighted on the salience map that was important for the for the neural network. Um, but then again, I don't know how the network decides. So I couldn't like if I see an image, I couldn't like highlight the part. I mean, I could highlight the part where I think the network should look. But then again, I mean, there are lots of papers like the Clever Hans paper, which saw like the revealed that there are some Sometimes it would look at uh, watermarks on, on the photo. Um, right. So th these are like these things that we just don't know uh, what the neural network bases this on. Yeah. If I could take a stab at that answer, I'd, for one, I, I think just the idea of, quote, a saliency map is a problem. Like there isn't one map of, of the importance of the pixels. It's like they're they're operating on multiple multiple dimensions or at least sort of multiple feature sets it's like if you ask me to tell you know why is this image a dog you know well for one thing it's it's the overall shape you know it has four legs and you know two ears sticking out over here that's one saliency another is that it's it's got a certain color you know and, it, and its coat and that's a that's a different mm -hmm. concept of what's salient and another is that there's a frisbee flying at it and its mouth yeah. is open and it's about to catch it and i know dogs do that so there are kind of you know, when your mind analyzes an image, it breaks it down into these many large scale kind of structural features. And I think that gets completely lost in most of the approaches yeah. to saliency maps. This is really important point, actually, because if you're just looking at the pixels on this kind of 2D planar manifold, that's only a very, it is quite literally a surface view. And I think, Christoph, you said that there are all sorts of causal structures and even in the model itself, right? There are um, these entangled neurons mm -hmm. and surely that's giving me more insight into what's actually happening. Just seeing a bunch of pixels. And the other thing is that these models that they are completely lacking in robustness. So probably mm -hmm. if you changed a few of the wrong pixels, your saliency map has just got completely broken, right? Yeah. So, um, but in, in that vein, some of these uh, feature visualization techniques, you know, like the deep dream type yeah. stuff, maybe maybe that's a better way of, of um, interpreting these models. Yeah, um, so like the one point you mentioned about the adversarial example, so there's also a paper, I, don't, I forgot the title again, um, which 
uh, manipulated uh, neural networks, so they would give the same uh, prediction for all the images, but different explanation, like different saliency maps. So this is perfectly possible to create different explanations um, for the saliency maps, um, but but keeping the model, like at least for the predictions, the same. There's another criticism you can throw at saliency maps, where they, they can be quite deceiving. You think they're useful, and then they turn out not to be useful. Yeah. There's a classic example of looking at you know, comparing a dog to a wolf, and sometimes you see it's looking at the snow in the background, and that's helpful. Sometimes it highlights the animal, and you think, okay, I understand, it's looking at the face. That's why it thinks it's a dog, because it's seen the face. And then you look at the predicted class for something else, like, you know, a cat, or mm -hmm. a frisbee, or a house, or a boat, and it highlights the face as well. Yeah. So the saliency map for all these different classes looks the same. Yeah. And when you realize that, you realize this, this saliency map hasn't actually told you anything about why it's gone for one class versus yeah. the other. All it said is that it just highlighted the thing in the middle of the picture. Yeah, I think that's especially also when, when you look at images, you know, like we're very good uh, with images. You know, like we're very quick to see what's happening on a scene and such. So we, I think we're also very quick to make judgments. Oh yeah, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense. It's more difficult to interpret, like if you have like a graph and there's like things going on, and so and you have to, like now understand what a method does and stuff like this. But for a p image like a heat map, I have this area's highlight makes sense. Um, case closed. Um, uh, I like the method. Yeah, and, and that gets exactly back to the deceptively deceptively good explanations problem and explaining complex things with complex things we don't understand. And so I, I think a lot of people, if they looked at it, and again, one of the points of this interpretability is really the social aspects of it, right? Like being able to convince people to be at ease with machine learning models or to accept the results of, of a machine learned, you know, decision process. And I think if, if somebody looks at an image of a dog, you know, they have no problem understanding that. Mm -hmm. But if you showed them a bunch of salience maps or, or any of the other sort of, uh, you know, feature projections, if you will. Like you said, it takes a lot of deep understanding to understand those, whereas the image is kind of immediately obvious. Yeah. I, I think two of the main themes that you touch on is, we'll, we'll get to the um, to the probabilistic stuff, the, the Judea Pearl stuff in, in a minute, but I think the main issue that you point out is feature dependence, okay? And, and you say that when you have feature dependence, it makes attribution and extrapolation problematic. Mm -hmm. So a dependence just means that you've got correlated or shared information between your features, right? So you say that in uh, feature permutation methods, um, it, it, these things basically break everything when you have this shared information and the extrapolated data points are no longer in the distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you say that there are conditional permutation schemes, you know, that try and, and maintain that joint distribution, but those things sometimes make it even worse, right? So yeah. do, do you think that's one of the most important things that people should think about when using IML methods? Yeah, at least so. Um, that's that's a, at least like a very um, deep issue, I would say, uh, which is inherent in, in most of the model agnostic methods where you manipulate your data, see what how the model prediction changes, and then uh, create your explanations out of this. So this is like the Shapley value, line, partial dependence plot, feature importance. They all work with this mechanism of manipulation, uh, of the data prediction and then kind of aggregating the results. And most manipulations um, happen in isolation so that you, for example, um, um, when you, for feature importance, you permute one of the features, as I like said uh, sometime before, um, and then, well, you break the association with the target, but also with your other features. Um, but similar things happen if you use LIME, so you, um, Kind of replace parts of your image, but then again, you also have to replace it with something like, which is I think in line the default is with just a gray image, and then of course uh, it's not a like it's outside of your data distribution suddenly because it, your network was not confronted with like these patchy images before they had like just normal photographs usually and um, depends on your neural network, but um you certainly didn't train it on on images where parts were grayed out. So it's pretty unclear what the model should predict on and what it will predict at this point. But but you you use these images to create your data set, like you send it through the neural network, you get predictions and you kind of aggregate from this your explanation. Um but but you left your data distribution and, and your model can do anything uh then. And the hope is that it doesn't do anything crazy, but yeah, you don't know. Like it, like a simple example 
from the medical field would be that you know height and weight are highly correlated mm -hmm. right and and on the other hand sort of the ratio or some relationship between your your weight to your height that actually has very important medical consequences mm -hmm. right that's that's a measure of of health and so if i were to sit there and just permute say the height index and create a whole bunch of people that, that had all these bizarre combinations mm -hmm. of of height and weight you know, first of all, those don't even probably exist in the data set, and the ones that do exist in the data set probably had some medical issues, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, you, you actually gave a similar example. I think you gave the example, Christoph, of a baby that yeah. earns a hundred thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. which is which is insane. But when you talk about something like Lyme, maybe that's different because the CNN, the what you know, it, it shines a flashlight over the input space, and, it, and it's an, it's a kind of local method. So mm -hmm. in some sense, you could argue that it doesn't matter that you've grayed out all this other stuff, because if the model was sufficiently well trained in the first place, it should hopefully learn to ignore the background, or, or is that mm -hmm. just wishful thinking? That's an interesting thought. I, I haven't thought about it, because like the property of like, um, that you have these filters that just wander over the, the image. Yeah, M maybe it, would make it more robust for these kind of uh, um, interventions that we do when we create these images with Lyme and Shapley. Um, yeah, I haven't thought about it. It, it, it could be, yeah. Well, we've mentioned all of these ways in which interpretability methods can go wrong, right? How the model might not be a realistic, the interpretability model might not be a good approximation to the actual ML model. So some people a bit controversially perhaps take the idea and run with it and say you're just barking up completely the wrong tree and you should give up using interpretability interpretability methods to explain these black box boxes let's ditch them instead just use an interpretable model to begin with use a white box model i think there's an example um, from compass in the us which is that model to predict mm -hmm. reoffending. and i think quite famously there was a investigative journalist that tried to interpret this model it was a black box model because it's proprietary, right? It's, it's yeah, a trade yeah. secret. And they they fitted a proxy model, a, a kind of a linear model, and they made a report saying, okay, we think your model is racist because it looks like it's it's take, taking race as a factor. And then some further work was done and they came back and said, well, actually, you've just used a, a interpretability model that doesn't really fit our model very well. You've made some assumptions that don't hold. If you use a different interpretability model, you get a completely different answer that it doesn't use race at all as a factor. And so you've got to kind of a you've got to a wrong assumption by using a bad interpretability model. And I think they were saying that this model, instead you could get just, just as good a model of reoffending with like three if-else statements, you know, ditching this massive complex 100 and something features and just use three if-else statements based on, I think, age and reoffending. Mm -hmm. So is that is that what we should do? Should we just drop these methods and start using white boxes instead? So, uh, I mean, like one one thing to mention here is that a white box is very soon also like a gray or a black box um, if you add interactions, if you have many features and so on. But putting that aside, um, I would agree with you in first place, like that you say you should start with like a white box. So if, if you start modeling, then then you, then you should um, consider these first. Like maybe they already solved your problem, that, then it's perfect. And you have a model that, that is quite, I mean, stable, it's interpretable. Um, I think that would be great. Um, but then I think the next step would be to see like what like a black box or a machine learning model would give you in terms of performance. And then maybe if you see this, the gap is really big, then maybe you can try some feature engineering and close the gap maybe from the interpretive model to the machine learning model. But then you're probably already uh, infusing some um, features that are not so interpretable, uh, or maybe um, if you're using a linear regression model, you're maybe using then splines on interactions. So you're already moving towards more complex models usually. Um, but then if you still have a gap, then I think you have to decide is the gap in predictive performance um, like worth changing to a black box model. So um, I think that's your mm. the, the decision will be different in, in many cases. Um, Actually, it relates back to a point you made in your paper about criticisms of using interpretable machine learning models. That some people leap straight away to using an overly complex yeah. model, when sometimes, depending on the situation, sometimes you know a linear model can do just as well and have all these advantages. It's so much easier to explain. Do, do you have a philosophy from a high level here, right? Because um, if it if it were a human, if it were an airplane pilot we don't really understand how the brain works right we we would just test the pilot 
you've got to fly the plane for 10,000 hours and if you don't crash then we'll let you fly so we don't really seek to understand how his or her brain works but with machine learning models there's this continuum right so um, if you use these complex black box models the predictive performance is usually better but you're trading off understandability and assuming those things are completely mutually exclusive what kind of decision process do you go through when you select these models but by the way with machine learning right the reason why we use machine learning is because we don't understand how to do something explicitly yeah is that a fair statement um yeah i would say um when when your data is like so high dimensional so complex many interactions and so on um that your simple models don't cover the complex cannot cover the complexity i think then you need machine learning would you rather understand exactly how the plane worked or would you rather i mean if, if i was saying to you you can go and fly in a plane would you rather that you understood how the plane worked or would you rather that the plane was tested why not both <laughs> so um i think yeah, we can well. do both and, and some, and to some degree so um of course with black box model we don't exactly understand how they work um but in comparison to a pilot we can test them for free more or less um so because i mean maybe it's not as good as an interpretable model um but we still can use a lot of methods to at least approximate and, and try to understand a few properties of this model. So I think we are even in a situation where we don't have like these complete like A or B decisions, but we can have, so if, if the machine learning model works much better and it's like really robustly tested with lots of different data, I would prefer a machine learning model, I guess. Um, but then I would also want to like people to, to apply all these methods that, that are available even if they are not perfect but still they give you something they give you some insights so yeah and, and i think so tim one answer to your question is that a lot of people's response here and kind of demanding interpretability and having concerns about machine learning it all comes down to generalizability and we've seen through using machine learning that it breaks down in ways that, that we don't like like for example sure maybe the soap dispenser you know is really great at uh at dispensing at dispensing soap you know 87 percent of the time but it just so happens to kind of be a, a race sensitive soap dispenser and just doesn't give any soap to people with a certain skin color like we've kind of decided as a society that are that there are certain generalizations or certain dimensions along which our, our models just have to perform. And also because a lot of these, these things that break machine learning models are things that happen quite, quite regularly in the real world. It's like a pilot, you know, a human being pilot flying around, if he looks down at the ground and sees a hot air balloon with a big smiley face on it, he's not gonna crash the plane. He's just gonna be like, oh yeah, I forgot about the uh, the hot air balloon contest that's going on today. Whereas a machine learning model, if it looks out a camera and sees something with a particular shape of lightning bolt, you know, it might just decide it's time to like dive for the ground, right? And, and crash the plane. Like that's sort of what these adversarial examples kind of show. And I think that's why people are really hungering for human understandable explanations because still to this day, the human brain is the only AGI really that, that we have around. Yeah, but deep learning models that they, they, they essentially memorize lots and lots of things and they have this sparse coding. So in a way, it's just like the white box model, even if we use interpretability methods, we could enumerate all of the things that they are learning. And one of those things might be a sensitivity or lack of sensitivity to hot air balloons with smiley faces on. But even if we could enumerate all the things that they are learning, we wouldn't understand that either. In the same way, we don't understand how a real human's brain works. And I'm not sure whether we should view a human brain as a computer program and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But um, at some, I guess what I'm saying is at some point, we have to accept that we're not going to understand. Oh, totally. It's such a, it's a good comparison, I think, with humans. You know, if you're interviewing and you want to hire, let's say, a software developer, you tend to set them a coding interview. You wouldn't think of taking them into surgery, opening up their brain and trying to find the neuron that predicts what the next you know, bit of code is going to be and understanding how that works. It's just, why would you do it that way? Instead, you learn to trust humans by you know, working with them, giving them a test, seeing how they perform in the real world. 
and I, you know, maybe we're asking too much of a machine learning model if you want to be able to understand these complex things in terms of like a bottom-up white box set of rules. Yeah, I think where the, where the comparison falls a bit short is that that we have the luxury that we can cut off the uh, like cut open the brain of a machine learning model um, without breaking it and without hurting it, hopefully. Um, and we can do all these, uh, try out all these interpretation methods, uh, see how it behaves under certain situations. And um, I also would make a distinction between we understand what's going on inside and doing like this kind of sensitivity analysis where we just try out what happens in certain scenarios. Um, so it always do that, um, that we can like check like how it behaves. So I mean, feature importance is basically like a way to see like how does it behave if we break some features and then we rank the features by this yeah. uh, as an importance. Um, we can do it and, and um, that's also the big difference between humans because we can't test in the same way and yeah, shouldn't probably. I, I think there's, there's one other difference though, which is to do with the substrate of how neural networks work. I think if I'm, if I'm giving someone a job interview or something, I, I, I mean, of course, it's a very uh, <laughs> fallible process, but I'm looking at their values and I'm looking to try and understand how they would behave in different situations. And I'm coming up with lots of illustrative examples. But the difference is with, with humans, we have that level of generalization. Um, we have a kind of guiding taxonomy of behaviors, which means if I if I know if, if I have guiding examples of what a human will do in certain situations, I expect that to generalize. Whereas my hypothesis is, is that a, a deep neural network model is almost like an infinite number of rules and there's absolutely no carryover between the rules. So knowing even some or even most of the rules doesn't really tell me about those edge cases. Yeah, I would agree that the, the edge cases are quite unforeseeable, probably. I mean, w at least we know that they exist, like with adversarial examples. So even if we don't know like exactly what they will look like, or there's even an infinite amount of, uh, I mean, there's an infinite amount of like how you can uh, change the image to make it uh, like have a different class. So we know, so I think it's important that we know that these exist at least. Yeah, I, lo I love the point you made, though, that we have we have the luxury to do analysis on these on these boxes because we can open them up. And that that's another point. I'm pretty sure that you make this in your book as well, which is that part of this is just scientific inquiry. It's, it's like understanding better how to interpret and explain machine learning models will probably actually contribute to us being able to construct even better machine learning models. Isn't that true? So, so you're basically saying that um, also interpretability might help to to be better at um, like create better machine learning models themselves. Yeah, like as we as we develop these interpretability methods, because in in a sense, like you pointed out earlier, they're statistical projections of kind of the mm -hmm. behavior of the model, and so like a, a saliency map. You know, if we can if we can kind of mm -hmm. use that to learn the way in which the the neural networks are behaving, it may it can certainly give rise to yeah. intuitions on ways to alter the model. Yeah, so I also have seen approaches where they. Um, try like kind of fuse also these two two worlds like uh, interpretable models or white box models and black box models so that you try to to generate features out of a black box model which you then use in your uh, under more understandable uh, white box model so um i think this this and and this also like using similar techniques um to which you would use for interpretability like detecting interactions for examples for example so um, yeah, these can be used um, also to, to build better models and also to build better interpretable models. The other, and I'll make one last point here, which is another social good that can come out of interpretability is, imagine we, we've got you know an ML model that's not trying to make any decisions, but it's just trying to figure out what leads to happiness and, mm -hmm. and success in life. You know? And so we analyze a whole bunch of data and we find out, well, it's really important if you graduate from high school and it's really important if you you know don't have children before you're married and you know all these other factors if we can dive in and, and kind of isolate those factors it actually allows people to have some guidance on oh look we've had this machine learning model that's analyzed a bunch of data and it actually has some some understandable recommendations mm -hmm. yeah. for how to lead a healthier life or a better life or whatever yeah i think that this is a very good example where um 
the fact that you have a prediction model doesn't solve your problem. Um, so actually, it's just a means to um, to to some other goal. Uh, in this case, understanding like what are the factors for happiness. And um, one example I am from a friend who worked at a telecom company. Um, they built like a churn prediction model um, to see like who who will qu quit the telecom contract. Um, and then they started like the the ones with the highest likelihood. They started uh, sending out emails, hey, maybe offering them a better deal. Um, but actually, the outcome was that um, well, they they when they once they wrote to the customers, they well left uh, and quit their contract. So it's kind of had like so th th this is a case where the prediction model actually works. But then people leave. Uh, in this case, probably because they realized, ah, shit, I have this contract still uh, going on. Um, time to quit now. Um, so if you <laughs> knew the reasons why they are likely to churn, then you could like better select like um, when you write some email or maybe some other campaign or where, when maybe not to write anything at all. Uh, yeah. Right now, um, Christoph, you have a background in stats, which means you I mean you like Connor as well. We take an incredibly dim view of machine learning, and <laughs> you wonder how how is it possible for us to be stabbing in the dark like this? But you know, you said that we need to be more rigorous, and there's no quantification of uncertainty with the current IML methods. And I and I, I suspect you might be working on some methods behind the the scenes on this. But you know, when when you have models and explanations which are computed from data, they are subject to uncertainty, yeah. and that's just not um, modeled at all at the moment, right? So we need to be making making some distributional and, and structural assumptions that we're not making now. And you point out that there's this phenomenon of p-hacking, which is a huge problem in the natural sciences, which hasn't quite made its way to IML methods yet, but probably will do. Yeah, so yeah, so the, I think, and, and statistics, we're really good at quantifying uncertainty. I mean, this also has some darker sides with like the p-hacking and so on, but I, I still would say it's better to have um, not only just one number or one explanation, but also have the distribution to do of this explanation or this number and to quantify what uncertainty is behind computing this number. So when you have a linear model, then you get um, some coefficient, which you interpret in the end. Um, but usually you don't just interpret the coefficient, but you look at the confidence intervals. Um, but we don't do it at the moment for uh, interpretability. So you maybe get the saliency maps, but how certain are you about, maybe it's a bad example because we uh, dumped so much on it. <laughs> um, but if you have like a feature importance value and you get some result, how, like what's the range actually, like how much variance is behind it? If I were to use slightly different data or refit my model again, how similar would the number be? And I think that's something that will or should come to interpretability as well. It's funny how when we come to machine learning, it's almost like, open season and forgetting everything you know about maths and stats you throw it all out the window get so excited about these algorithms right like one example is if you take a if you're fitting a model to predict something that was unlikely i don't know maybe it was like a covid test for example and then if you know the prevalence of covid you get it back you kind of know what the false positive rate is going to be and so you know there's that uh, you think it's the multiple comparison issue right you know that you're expecting a certain level of false positives when it comes to doing something like feature importance or looking at interpretability from a thousand features and then five come through is really, really important. As you mentioned, sometimes we just forget that multiple comparison issue, forget the fact that probably these five are gonna be completely false positives and probably completely meaningless. Yeah, I agree. Um, especially if you have like these high dimensionality features. And for the record, uh, I have to say, I mean, there are already approaches, so especially for feature importance, um, because there's like a huge community in random forests, for example, and they thought a lot about these issues and their tests for this and stuff like it. Um, but for the rest of interpretability, I think it could gain a lot um, thinking more about, I mean, this is very simple stuff like um, multiple comparisons, uh, quantifying uncertainty. This is stuff like statisticians think for, like a long time already um, about it. Um, and I mean, if you, even if you leave the area of interpretability and look at the benchmarks, so even like if you have like accuracy, like a table and you see accuracies in it, but there's no uh, variance attached to it, then you should be like suspicious of it. But because if you just retrain your uh, neural network with a different seed, you might end up with a different occurrence in the end. So, and if you say, want to say a method is better than another method, you want to quantify uh, how 
larger ranges of um, uncertainty do you, I mean, there are a lot of things like the choice of data, choice of splitting points and training and test data, uh, weight initialization and so on. So I think a lot of uh, this rigor from statistics uh, could help um, the machine learning community and, and machine learning science to become better. Yeah, but let's let's never forget this uh, quite quite well known saying, which is there are three kinds of lies: lies, damned lies, and statistics. So you know that that's a lot of what's going on, right? Is is you know fundamentally, whenever we go measure data and we have a model, what we're actually able to extract from that data and and the model is inherently probabilistic. It's a probability distribution, right, at the end of the day. And we get into trouble anytime we try to take that probability distribution and project it to numbers, i.e. statistics. Like as soon as we start trying to, to generate, and it doesn't matter whether it's, it's a mean plus a confidence interval or whatever, the fact is we're throwing away information. The totality of the information is sitting there in that weird multimodal, you know, mm -hmm. spread out distribution, right? And then we... We find some way to simplify it and project it down to a set of numbers. We've got a problem. Like that's, and if you forget that that's happening, if you forget that you're throwing away all this information, I think that you know the tendency to do that isn't just simplification. It's that oftentimes we have to use these probabilistic things to reach a decision. And as soon as we get to the point where, look, I've got to choose either to go left or right, give the loan or not give the loan. As soon as we get down to some point where we have to make a concrete decision we're forced, you know, we're forced to project it, right? But along the way, it's important not to lose sight of the, the fact that we're throwing away information. Fantastic. Well, um, and by the way, I, I, you also said something interesting a minute ago, Christoph, which is about, at least in most machine learning algorithms, if you change the random seed, you know, that, that there's enough stability there that it still gives you roughly the, the same model every time. But in reinforcement learning, uh, if you change the random seed, the entire thing is is, is completely broken. But um, but yeah, what, what Keith was saying about this this um, this information and structure and models, I think that's really interesting because people have said with reinforcement learning, you can actually learn causal factors, right? But that's not really true. You're interacting with a system, but what you're learning is is a surface representation of causal factors. So you might learn that there's a causal factor between um, like a hose putting out fire, but it wouldn't actually learn that it was the water that put out you know that th there was a causal relationship between the water and the fire and this is the case with so many of our models as we were saying earlier that there's there's just a, a surface representation which doesn't actually represent the reality of our world at all but this brings me on to the next point because you have a real problem with causal interpretations of some of these iml metrics right and you you say that models well the, the goal of models is that they should reflect the causal structure right this is what we want to do in science but most statistical learning just reflects these surface feature correlations they, they don't even scratch the surface of what we want so what are we going to do right are, are you doing some work in this field to, to help us out here and and why are people making these fallacious interpretations yeah so so i'm not not working on anything causality re related at the moment yeah but about about causality i mean uh, kind of like um i i studied statistics bachelor and master and and zero i mean the only it's uh, time we were uh, talked about causality was when I heard the sentence uh, correlation does not imply causality and uh, it was really about it so um, I think it's like really um, yeah should be taught a lot more like how to think about causality like it's just super simple things like you should include confounders or um, like what types of features if you include them in the model um, like uh, destroy your causal interpretation of another features this these are not super difficult things so um there you don't have to like learn any like difficult frameworks to work with or or read like uh causality books on it that's like super simple um yeah rules of thumb for your features even um yeah and i think you also have to decide um or distinguish between um like what's the goal of your model do you want an, uh, a causal interpretation um, or do you want to like, because in a sense, um, you have to also uh, distinguish between two levels. You have the real world level and the model level. I mean, once you use features for the model, they are causal for the model prediction, of course, because you designed it that way. And the question is, when are you allowed to go to the real world level where you say, okay, this um, the feature importance that I see here, or also the feature dependence, plot that I see is also causal um, 
or and may interpret it as a cause and uh, or as a causal effect also for for the real world and I, I think that also depends like if you need this interpretation and if you do scientific modeling for example then you probably want it um, but there, there can also be good reasons to include non-causal features into your model if your goal is really just prediction and and some feature might help you with the with a good prediction um, but it might not be causal at all Yes, but the, the problem is when we're using these deep learning models, mm -hmm. they they will learn a structure, which probably has no relationship to, to the real world whatsoever. But um, I think causal um, factors do generalize much better. There's the example of, um, I don't know, with, with car crashes, right? Male testosterone levels is a causal factor. So that will probably generalize to other locations where you didn't train your data on. But um, unfortunately, models don't really do that. Well, but so just real quickly on that, Tim, like the only reason that we know testosterone is a causal factor is, is not from that data set. It's from a bunch of mechanistic, you know, scientific research in biology and, and elsewhere. Um, so, you know, I, I'm kind of wondering how it would be nice if at least machine learning methods could indicate that there may be the possibility of a causal structure. So just looking for underlying hidden structures um, that you know that are more generalizable that could explain large pieces of the of the data and give kind of a list of hey there might be a causal factor here like go investigate it but on on that that there's a difference between a causal factor and a causal structure i think that the challenge is that we don't have enough fidelity in the structure but mm. bengio by the way is doing some interesting work on this using data uh, driven approaches to um you know learn causal factors but it's the structure of the factor graph which i think is the important thing i mean this is one of the most interesting parts i think of machine learning actually trying to learn causation from a data set which you can do right things like bayesian networks where you specify all your variables you connect these nodes with edges and you can try to learn the optimal structure like the simplest structure and that sometimes turns out to be the real life causal effect if you do it but, well but the difference is you as a human you you know the causal structure and you've you've created that that graph so it's not learned you've created it you can learn these things from data right you can actually you can search over the set of all possible graphs all the possible edges and mm -hmm. you have a bit of a loss function you try to find a graph that fits the data well so it's got enough edges but it's not too complex you're not relating everything to everything yeah. And so just from data without any human input with structure learning, you can sometimes get a model that kind of out of nothing will give you the causal relationships. Sometimes there is redundancy, right? Because a graph that says A implies, you know, causes B causes C, that's identical to C causes B causes A. Right? But, but, but even then, with, with structure learning, you, you've got this adjacency matrix and all of those nodes, you've already come up with a priori. So what you want to learn yeah. is what the nodes are themselves, yeah. right? Yeah, I think like what Connor mentioned, there's also more the setting where you have well-defined features. And I think what Tim referred to was more like the, you don't even know what the features are. Like if you have a convolutional neural network and, and like, what's an object, um, what, what is a feature that like is disentangled also from other objects. Um, so I think also there is the, the big issue that you have this entanglement between concepts that, I don't know, that the Frisbee is always with uh, on the same image as a, as a dog. So um, maybe the, 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 the neural network can't even separate these two things then because they are too entangled in the data set to yeah. even discover the structure that, that, that is really underlying the, the real world in this case. That, that's a fascinating point, actually, because one of the reasons why there's no easy solution to adversarial examples is because you, you, you learn these, these non-robust features. And you might just think to yourself, well, um, fur is a low magnitude feature. It's really easy just to kind of create fur on anything and fool the neural network into thinking it's a cat. And you just say, well, this is obvious, right? You just create some rules to say, well, if it's, if it's not an animal and fur, then ignore the fur. But actually, the features are entangled in this complex neural network, so you can't do that. But I, I, I 
wanted to move the discussion on a bit. So you said that there are some really interesting challenges ahead in, in IML. And what's fascinating is you start talking about the process. So you say that the setting of machine learning is too static. It doesn't reflect how these models are used in reality. And models are embedded in a process or a product or even complex people interactions. And I love this, right? Because I talk about ML DevOps and machine learning models in isolation are irrelevant. It's the people and the process. That's where the complexity is. Even with intelligence itself, it's a process, right? You know, intelligence is the interaction between a brain, a body, and an environment. And, you know, within the context of this process, you know, we've got all of this rich information that we could be bringing in from other disciplines. And you're saying we should bring in comp sci and stats folks, and we should be uh, bringing in psychologists and social scientists. And we need to also have interpretability at a higher level, at the institutional level, right? Or at the society level. So when you kind of broaden the discussion out a little bit, I, th I think it adds a nice bit of flavor. Yeah, so it's it's very as a, especially as a scientist, it's so convenient to just have this fixed model, a fixed data set, and then you just geek out and, and invent all these methods and so on. But the reality is that that uh, that you use the method some some place, and then it interacts with uh, the institution it's built, with the developers it's built by, with the people it affects. And my favorite example there is um, when you have this closed loop where um, your model makes predictions and these predictions generate the next generation's data. So for the next generation of the model, it produces the data. So um, there's this example of um, the rent index where you have this model that tell, tells you how much rent you should like pay for a certain kind of apartment and so on. And, and this is actually like um, legally binding so if you're uh, land if you're a landlord you you have to accept kind of the range that is outputted by the model which also means that um, the data that is produced so the new flats that are rented out in new apartments um, they they all have to fit the model kind of and then but then you use this data again to train your model so you have this very weird uh, feedback loop and right. um, I think it's also difficult to wrap your head around it and understand the implications of it. That that same thing, a very similar feed, feedback loop was a fear in the, you know, in our algo shambles video about the UK testing, since they couldn't conduct the, the uh, what was it, the A-level test, right, Tim? They they built some some models around that. And so it would do things like, well, you know, if this school historically never had anyone in this grade bucket, then we're not going to assign anyone to that grade bucket in that school. And so it's sort of this self-perpetuating, you know, feedback loop. We were reading through a lot of your work and you, I mean, I'm just going to hit this point head on. Um, you don't really talk that much about AI ethics and, you know, there, there's the F word, which is the fairness word. And, and I, I don't I don't recall you ever using that word. And is that something that you've deliberately shied away from? Um, yeah, I just like um, define it as outside of the scope, like to talk or to, to I don't know, talk about ethic. So um, fairness metrics or so on, because I think that's a really big field on its own. And I just don't know as much like about all these um, things. So I know a little bit like about the fairness metrics that are out there. Um, I also think, I mean, they're kind of, like research-wise, a little bit overlapping, but more or less separate fields, I think, interpretability and fairness. Um, but of course, they have some commonalities that, I mean, when you kind of, to for fairness, you have to look, it's not necessarily inside the model, but you have to study how the model behaves. Um, and that's kind of the connection to interpretability, I would say, yeah. Well, where, yeah, where I see the connection is work like yours is helping to build the tool set that will allow people to apply human, you know, intuition and, and ethics and evaluations to machine learning. Because it, at the end of the day, a lot of these are human moral judgments or ethical judgments. And it's important that people be happy with them because, you know, we have to have the population as a whole understand and accept and be able to move forward with the increasing role that machine learning is having in our lives. And building that tool set is necessary. So it's like you said very early in this talk, you know, what do we do? Just stick our heads in the sand and ignore it and just accept machine learning models are going to do whatever they do as long as they fly the plane or, you know, don't kill too many people. We're okay. Like, I don't think that's going to work. Like, we have to build the tool set that you're talking about and continue this process of exploring 
how to better explain and interpret ML models so that human beings can have that oversight because it's the only thing that's going to give us comfort really as a society. Yeah. I suppose the reason I segue to this is we were just talking about the process and you you mentioned some of these feedback loops because we can have a very superficial discussion and you could say well um we need to be able to represent reality better than we do and we have a whole tool set here to identify sources of bias or or you know lack of robustness etc in models but it's so much more complex than that because these models are used um in a very complex process and you get these very very uh, complex dynamics emerging as a result of that and i think we're only really just scratching the surface of of understanding Understanding those dynamics. Yeah, I, I think so too. Uh, as I said, I think in science it's always very easy to, to study things in isolation, like study one type of model, study one type of adjustment for a deep neural network. And um, hopefully we will see more work emerge on this. I, I think I've never read a paper like, um, I mean, of course, discuss the implications, but really like analyze like what happens in terms of the data and the model um, when we have like multiple generations for example of a model and how it changes over time but this thing i mean to study those things also means that you have to wait for a long time and, until um, you have these dynamics and i think in many cases it's just starting that, that we use these models more extensively in our daily life i have, I have a question is is anyone because look interpretability metrics, whatever they are, saliency maps and, you know, could be uh, partial dependency plots, whatever. You could actually build in some requirements of those into the objective functions when you go to train models. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I'm just going to come up with a crazy idea. I have no idea if this is relevant at all. But somebody could say, look, uh, I want all my saliency maps to be, you know, sets of, of uh, Bezier curves or something like that. Like they have to have a certain smoothness. Mm -hmm property and you could actually put that as a constraint in the objective function has anybody tried anything like that yeah there, there are approaches so I, I saw one paper they um added some um some parts to their objective function so that um, when you create line expl explanations with lime that they were most more stable um, and there are a, a, okay. a lot of things like and uh, for neural networks you have disentanglement that you try um that that the um feature maps or the, the, the nodes learn disentangled concepts. Um, there are ways to introduce like monotonicity so that a feature can always go into the effect of a feature can always be in one direction, not to like zigzag um, around. Um, so there, there are approaches to do this to um, like have okay. like interpretability constraints in your modeling. Yeah. Yeah, because I was just thinking this can go back to Connor. You know, Connor was saying earlier on, why don't we just create white box models? Maybe we can use, if the definition to a human being of white box is that it's interpretable and understandable, if we can build into the objective functions when we're actually training the network that it has these properties, then we'll actually be helping to create more white box yeah. you know, models, even if they are complex. Yeah, that, that's definitely an option, but I think the... Uh, issue remains the same that you with it's similar to a white box model. I mean, you make some trade offs in the end, you have to um, make the judgment whether uh, so when you put more constraints, I mean, you it can actually also help the model, of course. That if you, I mean, if you have some inductive biases also, um, which um, which you infuse into the model, which help with predicting or be more, more stable. Um, but sometimes you make maybe also a trade off with accuracy. And you just have to like in the end you have this um yeah this set uh, of models where some are more accurate some um better in this one interpretability dimension the other is uh cheaper to deploy and then you have this so this kind of going into the direction of like automatic machine learning and it uh, you don't get like just the best uh performing one but you have this Pareto set like well, so we have multiple objectives that you want to hit and then there's not one model that is, works best, but you have a set of models that, that have different trade-offs between these objectives. And then you have to decide um, what is the trade-off that you want to do, or like, that you want Makes to have. Sense. Well, I guess there's no getting away from it, is there? The interpretability is just going to get more important and more important. I think you mentioned, Christoph, that you know we've had linear models for hundreds of years, and then there's been this big explosion in deep learning, and then 
would you say about 2016 to 2018? That's when interpretability has really kicked off. I, what do you think? Do you think, where's it going? Are we just going to get more and more attention paid to this area? Um, I, I, I don't know if it can get more than, than this. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's at least here to stay. And I, um, yeah, I, I think it's important. I mean, it has been important before, but um, of course, with like the, the push from deep learning, especially, and um, that, that it, it just became more clear to a lot of people that we need interpretability in some sense, at least. Um, yeah, of course, people have attempted it before and, and worked on it before. And it's just more urgent now. I really like the bit in your book talking about what's what's changed recently, how interpretability is coming together as a field, you know, with this a unification. So, you know, in physics, we love a big unification when you take all these different things in the past and say, oh, they're all just part of this one big framework. And it was SHAP, that SHAP paper was amazing, wasn't it? Saying things like Lime, mm -hmm. Deep Lift, Layerwise Propagation, Shapley. Ah, forget all of them. They're all special cases of these additive feature attribution methods. And we can prove that this is the only one that's theoretically valid because it <laughs> has these properties of symmetry. It's got this dummy property. So, you know, everything that's been done before in interpretability, well, they're all in our framework now and Shapley values are the way forward. Yeah, they're quite, uh, quite famous, the Shapley values. Yeah. Would you believe them then? I mean, I guess in their paper, they kind of, they kind of disagree with Lime a bit, don't they? They say, well, Lime is a count of this, but they're going to be breaking our properties of efficiency and symmetry. So Lime is using the wrong weights, right? They should be using this yeah. kernel shap weights rather than the Lime weights. Yeah, I think that's just a different approach also to think about it. I mean, you don't, maybe you don't, I, I think, I think the properties are quite attractive or meaningful at least, um, but uh, also, also the Lime approach. I, I, I'm very critical about Lime because it. Um, I think it's difficult to um, have the correct uh, or to know like how to parameterize your uh, uh, your local models. Um, so I, I think I'm a bit more of a fan of Shapley values uh, because of the theoretical properties it comes with. So are you talking about that distance measure in Lime, where you yeah. have to be able to quantify how far away is the permutation? Yeah, the like. The kernel width, yeah, which is set to zero point seven five in the code, I think. Also, I just looked it up, and I mean, it's it's a very difficult question. It goes to the heart of inter like what's local, um, because like I mean, you have this this kernel that decides like how much you weight uh, all the data points around the point you want to explain, and and like how how big is this area? I think this is very dependent on your model and your data, and there's no answer, no easy answer to how to set it. Yeah, or even more generally than that, this this whole notion of what does it mean to have a local interpretation method in you know in text or vision. Mm -hmm. So in in vision, there's this super pixel concept, which yeah, is something yeah. that seems to make intuitive sense, but but does it? You know, when you create all of these different uh, maskings of, of different parts of of the input space. But um, with Shapley values as well, that they they are a beautiful a beautiful technique, especially because the the values are are quite meaningful. But if you have shared information between the features. I mean, Connor and I were talking about this. For example, you, you if you had the same model where you were predicting someone's income and you put their, I don't know, let's say you had salary in the model twice, then the Shapley value would be divided between the two exactly. duplicate fields, right? Yeah. So there just seems to be so much esoterica in these IML methods, right? Are we expected to know all of this stuff? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, that's why I wrote the book um, to, to capture these things that you have to know all the, these, these uh, disadvantages of the methods where I try to be very honest. I mean, because I'm not too invested in them. <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, that, that's with all tools that we usually have, um, also with statistics and so on, you, you have to know, like, um, these, like, as you mentioned this, if you have salary twice, then it will just, I mean, it depends also on what your model does, if it just picks one of the salary features or if it, it itself uses both. So this is also something that uh, will define how the Shapley value will look like later on. Um, but you have to know these yeah. things if you want to use Shapley values and interpret, interpret them correctly, yeah. Because I, I think philosophically, we've got, we've got the real behavior and then we use these interpretability methods and then we've got the kind of perceived behavior. So we've got these le these levels of modeling or, or do you know what I mean? Sim simplification. And it's all well and true. If you are dealing with data scientists who understand 
how these me you know methods work that's fine but invariably data scientists need to present this information to lay people and they are not going to understand all of the various different trade-offs and how information is being compressed and, and lost and so on. So do, do you see that as a, as a serious problem? Uh, yes, but it's not a new problem. It's with any number that you read in any newspaper. Uh, I mean, so in a sense, I mean, when, when you look at uh, outcomes of statistical models that, uh, well, everyone can understand, well, of course not because you need training to understand how to interpret a linear model or any regression model, yeah, there's this difficulty, but I don't think it's new in any sense um, because there's always, I mean, any number that you read anywhere has a very complex process. Um, so I don't know if you have like COVID testing numbers, it's very complex, like how the number was generated, maybe uh, like how it was aggregated over many states and like what cases it includes and which it doesn't. And so it, the number looks very innocent and simple, but there's a very long process behind it to produce it. Um, maybe this process is a bit uh, bit more black box or bit more difficult if it comes out if there's some machine learning in between machine learning model in between to generate a number. Um, but yeah, I think this problem is well old. Um, well, let me let me challenge a little bit here on something, which is okay. If I have if I have some general formula, just some very general formula, and then I go in there and I go, you know what, this formula has five parameters, and if I make this one 0.75 and that one one third, and this one two and that one zero, and I call this the Megatron, you know, uh, activation potential, and I go and write a paper about it, that's really just an arbitrary, you know, kind of selection of a bunch of numbers, and then you gave it a fancy mathematical passport, and you got it published in some journal, and now everybody has to memorize that as, you know, the Megatron potential and kind of learn about it. And that's a lot of what's going on right now is that it's really just a bunch of hacking. Like it's people just, they don't really know a general solution and they don't know how to solve, like in general, the problem they're trying to solve. And so they just hack around. And then the ones that are kind of famous or demonstrate some success in a particular combination, you know, competition over in this corner or something, it now becomes something that's part of the lexicon that we all have to learn. And I think, like I look back on this, like imagine what physics was like before Leibniz and Newton, you know, invented calculus. It's like everybody memorizing a whole bunch of little purpose-built kind of formulas. And then along comes a general framework, which now we can just learn calculus and derive the special circumstances as needed. You're onto something really interesting there, which is that with with IML methods, we are we are kind of compressing information down into a representation. You know, and then that that is a transport that can be understood by different people. But there, there's a trade off, right? Because as you said, you can learn calculus and that's a compact framework for doing lots of stuff. But it, it's all about the amount of common knowledge that is required. So it's possible to compress something down just to one symbol. And that symbol could represent all of that knowledge. But it doesn't help you because I still need to learn all of that knowledge. Yeah, but so uh, to me, calculus was a very beautiful and simple framework that I could learn. And then once I learned that simple thing, I could go and solve all kinds of problems with it that before I would have to memorize specific solutions or like the quadratic formula, for example, as a student, I didn't actually memorize the quadratic formula. I just learned how to complete the square. And then, then I would just do complete the square. And if somebody asked me what the quadratic formula was, I would just quickly derive it, right? Because it was easier to memorize the rule and then apply the rule to any situation rather than to memorize all these little one-off, yeah. you know, kinds of hacks that we come up with. You're not normal, Keith, right? So most people won't be able to go and understand this. Because the I thing is, these, well, no. well, no, these IML methods are brilliant for data scientists who can, it, it, it's a framework, right? It's a, it's a reference of understanding. So assuming that people can understand how Shapley values work, then this is a beautiful representation to, to reason about the behavior of models. Sure, but when I, when I first saw Shapley values, I realized immediately there's a connection in you know, Bayesian analysis to marginalization. You know, all we're really doing here is computing the expected marginal you know, contribution to this value. It's not a probability, but it's still the same procedure being done, right? And I think I'm gonna throw myself in with the lay people to a degree because the reason I'm always striving for simplifications is because I don't have the capacity to memorize 
all these little arbitrary kinds of hacks. And but I yet I could totally understand Bayesian analysis. And like I said, you know, previously in some other videos, statistics made no sense to me until I learned the Bayesian framework because that was based on very simple rules that I could then reapply as needed. I think that um, what you refer to, Keith, um, may, maybe the worst situation is with the saliency maps because you have so many methods and they all like backpropagate the gradient and to, to the in, input pixels. And to um, now, do you have to like learn like how dozens of these framework works or, or like uh, how, um, how to interpret do interpretation of all of these? And they're all kind of variants of each other. So mostly because they just there's some ambiguity how you uh, how you backpropagate the gradient um, because um, because of the nonlinear units and stuff and uh, little bit differences uh, how you can define this and so you have this huge like sea of uh, many different methods. Um, I, I think it would be nice there for, as you said, to have some like simplification where you say, okay, this is like all these methods work under this one principle, basically, and we have these two parameters um, and that's how they differ. And I think that's also that uh, some, I, I think I wrote something in a chapter um, that, that please uh, stop inventing new methods for uh, saliency maps. Um, so I, I think it's enough and, and we should focus more on like doing this consolidation to um, un like understand the limitations of the methods and, and consolidate them to see like what, what's the commonalities uh, and which ways do they differ and so on. That's probably actually my first impression actually when I first opened the interpretable ML book. That's amazing how many different things there are. I've you know I've heard people say, oh, you can't use machine learning. It's just a black box so many times. It almost been drilled into my head. Then seeing all the things, you know, from white box models, ways of training surrogate models, counterfactual explanations. It's what a wonderful recipe, right? There are so many different things that you can do. I feel like now I trust ML models more than other kinds of things because I have this amazing toolbox of ways to understand them. The thing that strikes me, though, is most of these methods, as we were just saying, they require interpretation by a human and a human who understands how the method works. Um, I, I love this concept of um, turning machine learning into an engineering discipline and being able to do a lot of these um, tests non-interactively. And I think, um, you know, Marco Ribeiro has done a lot of work around the counterfactual examples and the data grouping. And what, what excites me about these methods is they seem like methods that we could actually run as part of a, an automated process. We still have to set thresholds. Maybe we could set a threshold that said if, if this if this counterfactual example flips the switch on more than 1% of examples, then fail the build. That seems reasonable. But a saliency method? I mean, how the hell do you say, well, if there's lots of red pixels over here, then break the build? I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I also have seen interesting approaches to um, like using interpretability also more automatically, like um, when you do model um, uh, monitoring, you can do things like uh, create interpretations and see if they significantly change over time, for example. Um, so then have thresholds that warn you that, hey, um, something's going on with your model. Um, so I think that's also interesting um, approaches there. Yeah, you know, Tim, to your point of making this an engineering field and even making interpretability and, and understandability and engineering field. I mean, I think that maybe that's why I like your book so much, Christoph, is I think it's it's a step towards that direction. It's like, let's survey everything. And more importantly, let's create a finite and hopefully smallish set of simple concepts that we can all agree on and understand that we can use to catalog, catalog you know, what's out there. Um, so please keep up the good work. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm uh, interested to see where this goes. So final question for you, Christoph, then. I wonder what's what's next for interpretability? Like, are we going to the point where it's going to be almost a box ticking exercise where we can say, yes, our process, we've done the, the standard interpretability step. I mean, is it is computing power going to change it? I remember when, when SHAP, the library came out, it made that approach possible, whereas it previously, you know, was very hard, very computationally feasible. My friend Anjum, who's a wonderful data scientist, sent me NVIDIA Rapids. They've got that running on GPUs way faster than it was before. Is it just going to become a standard 
step, do you think? Or is it going to be something where you need decent subject matter expertise and some real thought to do, to really understand mm -hmm. how a model works? Um, so, well, predictions about the future are always hard. So I, um, maybe more like what I wish or what I yeah, maybe think will have could happen. Um, so, I mean, what we're seeing already is like a lot of implementations of the me these methods. So they're kind of getting a commonality. Everyone can use it. Uh, very easily there's a lot of uh, libraries out there in python r uh, but also in, in in like these machine learning um cloud tools they also have a lot of interpretation methods um, available now so I, I, in that sense i think and um, it's maturing a lot um I, I still believe that you need um some expertise to understand them or at least some good references and there will also be hopefully more than my book maybe have some uh uh, documentation when for for these tools and people answering on Stack Overflow questions and whatnot. Um, so I think um, yeah, it's it's getting we're getting that it everyone can use it easily. I I think it, it should never be a box ticking exercise. It's a similar thing when if you have an AI ethics you know governance process or something the last thing you want is for it just to be an automatic response so i've just you know yeah i've thought about ai ethics um it, need, it needs to be something that that we really engage with mm -hmm. I, I think we need to abstract away a lot of the complexity at the moment i think it's possible to come up with an interface to standardize the way that we do interpretability and we can um, reduce down what we have now to certain primitives which means that it can plug into an engineering process and it also means that we can abstract away some of the complexity mm -hmm. um, i think that's possible yeah I, I also would agree that it shouldn't be like just box ticking but you can like for the initial um when you start interpreting a, a model that you just have like with a click you have a report and then it shows you the most basic things but then you still like should ask the, the, like the question like does it really make sense that this feature is the most important one or what's happening there with these weird interactions between the two features let's uh dig a bit deeper here and see what's going on so i think um there's this one portion that, that is just like this automated reporting thing um but this should then be like the starting point for more critical uh questioning of the model or and, and and checking what's going on um, for some specific problems, maybe. So it's going to be you click on the Molnar report, <laughs> and it gives you the yeah. the report from the book, right? Yeah, that would be convenient. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Christoph Molnar, thank you very much for joining us today. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, folks, this is Tim in Postscript. There's just a couple of thoughts that didn't come to my mind during the interview that I think I'd like to quickly cover now. The first thing is on the lack of fairness. The reason why I, I raised that is most folks who talk about AI ethics and fairness, they use the toolkit of interpretability methods quite often, you know, to apply their trade. There are tools out there to mitigate fairness and to detect fairness. Microsoft's Fair Learn is a great example of this. What we really need is an operating model or a set of guidelines on how to implement these tools. How do I identify sources of problematic correlations we need to have a database of problematic correlations. Having a tool that allows me to identify and mitigate bias, frankly, is useless. What do I do with that? As we mentioned on the show, many of the machine learning cloud providers, whether it's DataIQ or Azure ML and SageMaker, they all have these interpretability methods built in now, including saliency maps. And it's just a box ticking exercise, frankly. It's completely useless. There is no accepted guidance on how these tools should be used, right? So if I'm a large company and I'm building an operating model around how to implement fairness techniques, just having the technology is irrelevant. It's about the people and the process and the, the kind of operating model of how we implement it. And there is basically no useful information out there to help us do that. The other thing is we spoke about this becoming an engineering discipline, which is to say, what if we could create an interface to abstract away some of the vagaries and esoteric of interpretability methods? We might come up with some primitives or some common language, and then we can hide the complexity behind the interface. This is kind of what we do with ML DevOps already. We automate as much as we can, and we templatize and remove friction out of the process. We even create building blocks using domain-specific languages or 
uh, YAML files and pipelines and and so on. So what we do is is we we create a level of abstraction where people can compose together pipelines. Remember when Connor made the comment that this might just become a box ticking exercise, and this is something we see in security and AI ethics already. We can't really trust people to self-report that the model is behaving correctly or that the project has no concerns from an AI ethics point of view. The whole point here is process. If we want to create an operating model and ensure best practices are followed or any kind of standardization in a large organization, we have to design a process and many eyes make shallow holes. So the process would mandate that a certain number of stakeholders were involved in assessing the particular IML technique and validating it essentially and then we would need to record that assessment so who said what when and then if the company ever became audited or if god forbid there was some kind of a problem where the IML model did something wrong and it caused the company lots of damage or it harmed the environment or society or something like that we would then be able to rewind the clock and say okay well Joe Bloggs said it was okay because of XYZ so that is an operating model it's a process and how to design such a process, again, is completely absent. Speaking as a chief data scientist myself, that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in, and it's very difficult for me to do that. I really hope you've enjoyed the episode today. We've had so much fun making it. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you back next week.